Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Ah, uh, please, uh, you're doing the Hindi translation, is it? Okay, fine. It would be, be convenient for you to get the Hindi volume of Bhagavatam, would it not? <laughs> Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 11, Text 2, Translation and Commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Sri... Yudhishtiraha Uvacha Bhagavan Shrotam Ichami Nurnam Dharamam Sanatanam Varna Ashrama Achara Yutam Yat Puman Vindate Param Sri Yudhishthiru Vacha Bhagavan Shrutam Ichami Yurnam Dharamam Sanatanam Varnashrama chara yutam Yat puman vindate param Shri Yudhishthiru vacha Bhagavan shrutam ichami Yurnam dharmam sanatanam Varnashrama chara yutam Yat puman vindate param Ladies, Sri Yudhishthira Vacha Bhagavan Shrotam Ichami Nam Sant Parnashrama Charayutam 
Kalpuman Vindate Param Shri Yudhishteraha Uvacha Maharaj Yudhishthira inquired Bhagavan, O oh my Lord, Shrotam to hear, Ichami, I wish. Nirnam of human society, Dharamam, the occupational duties, Sanatanam, common and eternal for everyone. Varna, Ashrama, Achara, Yutam, based on the principles of the four divisions of society and the four divisions of spiritual advancement. Yet, from which Puman, the people in general, Vindate, can enjoy very peacefully. Param, the supreme knowledge by which one can attain devotional service. Translation, Maharaj Yudhishthir said, My dear Lord, I wish to hear from you about the principles of religion by which one can attain the ultimate goal of life, devotional service. I wish to hear about the general occupational duties of human society and the system of social and spiritual advancement known as Varnashrama Dharma. <coughs> Purport, Sanatan dharma means devotional service. The word sanatan refers to that which is eternal, which does not change but continues in all circumstances. We have several times explained what the eternal occupational duty of the living being is. Indeed, it has been explained by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Jiveshwarup hoi. Krishna Nitya Das. The real occupational duty of the living entity is to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Even if one prefers to deviate from this principle, he remains a servant because that is his eternal position. But one serves Maya, the illusory material energy. The Krishna consciousness movement, therefore, is an attempt to guide human society to serving the personality of Godhead instead of serving the material world with no real profit. Our actual experience is that every man, animal, bird and beast, indeed every living entity is engaged in rendering service. Even though one's body or one's superficial religion may change, every living entity is always engaged in the service of someone Therefore, the mentality of service is called the eternal occupational duty. This eternal occupational duty can be organized through the Institute of Varnashram, in which there are four Varnas, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudra, and four Ashramas, Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, and Sannyasa. Thus, Yudhishthira Maharaj inquired from Narada Muni, about the principles of Sanatan Dharma for the benefit of human society. <clears throat> Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnanam Jana Shalakaya Chakshurin Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Shreshtam Manamapi Shachiputra Matra Swarupam 
Rupam tasya grajamurupurim maturim goshtavatim. Radha kundam girivaramaho radhika madhavasham. Prapto yasya pratita kripaya shrigurum tam natosmi. Vande hum Shri Guru Shri Ataf Kamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghuna Tanvitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitamscha Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. <coughs> Some um, clarifications here. Here um, in this verse, Sanatan Dharma, a well known term, is equated with Varnashram, Dharma. Srila Prabhupada sometimes said that Krishna consciousness is Sanatana Dharma, sometimes he said it equated Krishna consciousness or the, the Vedic culture with Varnashram Dharma. But how can Varnashram Dharma be Sanatana Dharma? Because Sanatana Dharma is the eternal occupation of the soul, and Varnashram Dharma is an arrangement for the social setup of people in this material world. Of course, it's there in the spiritual world also, but what's being, what Yudhishthira Maharaj is referring to is the Varnashram Dharma of the material world, in which people's positions are always changing. One may be a Brahmin in this life and a Shudra in the next life, and vice versa. So how can that be called Sanatan Dharma? Well, uh, this verse also says, Varnashrama Tara Yutam Yat Puman Vindate Param. The Varnashram is the system by which one can attain to the Supreme, which is devotional service. It, it helps one to come to that level. Varnashram Dharma can be considered eternal in the sense that although one's position within it, within the material world, is not eternal, it is an eternal arrangement by the Supreme Lord. <clears throat> Just like it's an eternal arrangement within the material world by the Supreme Lord that there's bhumirapo nalo vayu kangmano buddhire vacha ahankara iti yang me bhina prakujirashtadha. There are eight elements. Uh, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. So they are constantly uh, the, the, the interactions of these elements. As long as the material manifestation is manifest, these elements are in constant flux. But they are his internal principle that the material elements which constitute the material world are these elements. There are no others and there are no, there are no more than eight and there are no less than eight. Uh, so it may be said it's an eternal principle of the material world that there, is, that there are these eight elements. And similarly, it is an eternal principle of the material world, charto varnyam maya shrishtam guna karma vibhagashaha, the varnashram system which is not <clears throat> in and of itself a, the means to attain the Supreme, although it can be very helpful. Uh, in fact, according to the Vishnu Purana, uh, it is the means, uh, even Bhagavad Gita, it's also uh, the, the means to attain the Supreme, but uh, not exactly the means, but it, it is a very powerful vehicle. <clears throat> From Vishnu Purana there is the Varnashrama Charavata Purushena Parapuman Vishnu Raradhyate Pantananya Tattosha Karana. One can worship 
uh, Vishnu uh, via the Varnashram system. And there's no other way to please him, according to this verse, to satisfy the Supreme Lord. And from the Bhagavad Gita, we also have uh, the, uh, uh, there are two verses. Sve Sve Karmanya Bhirata Sangsitim Labhate Narha. By performing one's own duty within the Varnashram system, one can uh, attain to the Supreme. And what's the other one? Swakamana Sukamana Tamabhyacha Siddhing Vindati Teparam. Siddhing Vindati Manava. Uh, every man can achieve perfection by following this system, but the point is there, tam abhyarcha, simply to be situated, it means to worship him, simply to be performing one's duties within the Varnashram system, that is not in and of itself going to bring one to the perfection of life, but within that system, if one worships Krishna, then that will bring one to the perfection of life. So it's the worship of Krishna that is important, but then performing Varnashram duties can also be considered worship of Krishna if it's done specifically for the pleasure of Krishna. If it's not, then it becomes Asura Varnashram. If it's just the arrangement is there, but the, uh, the arrangement of society is there, but it's not focused on Vishnu. And of course, in the modern world, we have a situation in which uh, Varnashram is very much broken down. So, previously uh, within the caste system in India, which was a, uh, the remnants of the Varnashram system, there was no anxiety, what will I do in the future? It's already fixed up. With your birth comes your occupation, which in, with the modern idea of freedom is considered very bad. You don't have any choice. Of course, most of the people in the modern world today, if they had any choice, they wouldn't be doing the work they're doing. Most people don't like their work, as can be evidenced by seeing them at the bus stop at seven o'clock in the morning in any big city. They don't look blissful as they're going to work. They don't, they don't jump out of bed every morning and say, oh, great, another day of work. But they want to sleep as long as they can to forget that they have to go to work. So previously there was no anxiety. The barber's son is going to be a barber. The barber's daughter is going to be a barber's wife. <laughs> it's all fixed up. And you may say, well, there's no freedom, but there's also no anxiety. <laughs> so you can have freedom. We'll, we'll give you freedom to uh, stand on the edge of a cliff <laughs> with... Uh, with, with Snakes attacking you is freedom. What's that freedom? Better live comfortably and securely. Uh, but a major problem today, today well, let, let's say that other point, just like uh, you said that in this Gopal Garden school, the children were asked what they want to be in the future. I want to be a doctor, I want to be an engineer, I want to be an air hostess, prostitute. What do you want to be in the future? It's not fixed up. It's not fixed. And we find that most people, whatever they study for, they end up doing a different job anyway. <clears throat> we should teach. We're, 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 I'm, I'm speaking on this specifically today because we're having our Varnashram and Gurukul meetings, how to organize our projects. And the Gurukuls are meant for training boys as preachers, or if they're not going to be preachers, to graduate into our Varnashram society. There's a whole big world out there which they can enjoy. So we have to teach them from the beginning that this idea that we will enjoy ourselves by indulging in sense gratification, the actual fact is that people 
What to speak of not having the spiritual aim of life to satisfy Krishna, but the fact is that people in materialistic life are very much dissatisfied. And in fact, and the more people so-called advance and succeed, the more they become dissatisfied. This whole idea in, in the schools in India especially, I think it's more in India than in, in the Western. I, I don't remember it's when I was going to school as a kid saying, you have to be a success. There wasn't even much emphasis on getting good grades or anything. It was just, it was just like a formality that we have to go through the grinding machine of the school. And what happens afterwards? There was, there was one girl in our school who was very serious about studies. She got three A's in her A-levels and went to Oxford. Otherwise, the rest of us, we, didn't, we were much more interested in playing football than studying in the school and other things we are interested in, which I won't mention here. Uh, but the idea of being a success, we can preach to the students, there's nothing wrong with being a failure. This whole idea, you have to be a success. There's nothing wrong with being a failure. It's, if you don't succeed in your exams, it doesn't matter. The aim of human life is not to succeed in your exams. The aim of human life is not to get lots of money. It may be the children are going to Gopal's garden or something and they think, well, if I don't succeed in my exams, if I succeed in my exams, then I'll go and be a doctor. If not, I'll join the farm community. <laughs> they may think like that. But Material life is a failure from beginning to end. Let's list some of the greatest failures of the 20th century. Einstein, Queen Elizabeth II, uh, Hitler and Stalin. Stalin, he died in his bed. He wasn't, he lived a whole life of failure. They all failed because Ladva Sudur Lama Bidang Bahu Sambhavanti or let's say Prahlad Maharaj. Because it's supposed to be the Gurukul thing, right? So, Durlabang Manu Sham Janma Tarapya Dhruvam Artadam. That Prahlad says that the human life is very valuable, but it's very uh, short and it's uncertain. You can die at any time. So, we can tell people, we'll, we'll, we can do courses in the, we have all these personality development courses that devotees do in the college. Maybe a more important one to do is an anti-suicide course because so many of the students commit suicide. So we can have anti-suicide course. We'll train, the, we'll train the students not to commit suicide if they get less than 97% and then, the people, then their parents get on the case, oh, you only got 96%. That happens also. Why don't you get 100%? See, they are, you're only number three in the class. Failure. So we can tell there's nothing wrong with being a failure. This, this idea of being a success is nonsense anyway. So if they, what does it matter if they call you a failure? What, what does it mean, you're a failure? The real failure is if you fail to utilize your human life for achieving Krishna consciousness. And what does it mean to be a success if you're Success, uh, yeah, I, I've got a big house and a big car and big anxieties. What's the use? Is that, that's a success. They're cheating you. They're cheating you by calling, by giving this idea of success. And they have this idea. No, our society is so developed. You see, we have highways and, and space satellites and we're going to Mars. And every civilization thinks they're the best. The Romans thought they were the best. We're highly advanced. We have, we have chariots, high, high, highly developed chariots, which, and well-bred horses, so that we, fantastic, never seen in the history of the world before. Highly sophisticated. We can, we can go from one part of it, we can move a whole army from one part of our empire to another in only three weeks. Nowadays, you just send a plane, but they were saying, this is the most fantastically advanced civilization, the Roman civilization. 
And how many were Babylonian and civilization, Assyrian civilization, Egyptian civilization, British rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves, and what it's the idea that now our civilization is the most advanced. It's all nonsense. Don't be fooled by this nonsense. If you're a failure by the standards of this of these foolish people who want to drill you into a way of life which is of no benefit to you even materially, maybe it's a good idea to be a failure. <laughs> uh, there's a... Uh, someone sent me some, something from the internet. The two people in America, young men in America, one is 25 years old, has a university degree, $200,000 debt for his education, no job. But he's got a degree. Got a degree. The other one has no degree. He went for an apprenticeship in a blue collar. Blue collar means things like drilling holes in walls, shudra work. He had a paid apprenticeship and he's earning $20,000 a month or something, whereas the other guy is not earning anything. Uh, Joe is earning nothing. Jim is earning $20,000. He has no degree, but he's earning so much money. And uh, his assignment for today is to disconnect Joe's electric connection because he didn't pay the bill. <laughs> so it's, it's all bluffing. You can, this idea of failure, success. The worst thing is to be a failure. We agree the worst thing to be a failure, but if you fail your exam, that doesn't matter so much as if you fail your whole human life. Your whole life was a failure. But I had a, I, I had a big degree. Einstein said Einstein was a failure. Einstein was a failure? Einstein, yeah. He failed to understand that I am an eternal servant of Krishna. Came a little bit too early. If he had waited around, he might have got one of Prabhupada's books. But he wasn't fortunate enough. So we have to teach them the, the real facts. In the schools, they don't teach real facts. They, they, they inculcate this idea that you'll be happy by getting more and more money, which is not a fact. It's, it's, uh, it is a uh, pratyaksha, it is a perceptible fact that happiness does not increase in proportion to the amount of money you have. And often we find that the richest people are the most miserable. <laughs> the more we so-called succeed in material life, the more our desires increase. That's maybe one reason why that we find that, find that poorer people are not so miserable because they have, they have very little wants because their, their scope, their, their possibility to get many material objects is extremely limited. So they don't even think about getting the latest Mercedes-Benz car. They don't even think about it. They, they just... You saw the, that uh, in Dwaraka, the place where we had our program, it was in the middle of the Bungi colony. So you could see the, the women coming to the, the water source every day and putting, the, putting on their head the, the kaloshes, the water pots with water. So uh, they may think, well, I'm, it's better that one generation ago I would have had to walk five kilometers to get the water. Now I, I just have to walk to the end of the gully and get it. So they don't, they're not, uh, they're not dreaming of going to America or having a Mercedes-Benz car or any such thing. It's beyond their scope of possibility. But the more we so-called succeed, the more our so-called needs increase. For, uh, for a middle-class kid going to school in India, 
It's not enough to have a cell phone. You have to have a smartphone or an iPhone. Otherwise, the other kids will laugh at you. Is it not? You have to have the latest, most expensive, and your poor father has to fork out the money for it, which he can't afford. But he has to do it because otherwise, the children will, at school will laugh at his son or daughter. And they have to have the latest fashion, hairstyle, and this consumeristic society, they invent all kinds of things that people don't need just so that people spend their money. And they don't even have the money, they have to take a loan to get all these things. So they're in it, they're in it. This is the Sanatan Dharma of people in the modern age is being in debt. It goes on all through their life. <laughs> and they're just anxiety, that's all. So material education, it increases our desires. This, succeed, you should have a big position. It increases our so-called needs. <coughs> and we completely lose any knowledge of or interest in that which we really need. And we completely lose any understanding that we don't need all these so-called things. We don't need it. You can be quite content without it. Our farm communities are evidence of that, that people who are living in cities with all so-called conveniences, they've chosen to live a very simple life and they're very happy. And people come and say, how can you be happy without all these things? It doesn't make sense because in their mind, they've been given an equation, money plus house plus car, plus air conditioning, plus sending your children to America, etc., 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 equals happiness. So if you take all these things away, how can you be happy? Something wrong. Let's look at the calculation again. Looks like we got our arithmetic wrong. No, they taught you the wrong arithmetic. All these things added together equal more illusion, repeated birth and death. The real arithmetic is Savai Pung Sang Paro Dharma Yato Bhakti Radhokshaje Ahai Tukya Prahiti Hata Yayatma Suprasiddhati. Bhakti to Adhokshaja add to that Ahai Tukhi Aprati Hata and then you get. Yayatma suprasiddhati. That's the happiness equation. If you want, you can dress it up in some Greek symbols and say this, this, this symbolizes this and make it look very scientific. But actually, it is science. It's Bhagavad Tattva Vigyan. It's the scientific knowledge of the personality of Godhead. Bhagavad Tattva Vigyanam Mukta Sangasya Jayati. It's the knowledge by which you get free from your iPhone and your iPad <laughs> and your, uh, fr from your material aspirations. It's the knowledge by which you get, you get free from those things. In one of the early Back to Godheads, in, in, uh, in America, it was in the 1960s, there was an article by, I believe it was by Hanuman Prasad Poda of Gita Press fame. Uh, we sometimes used to do dramas about this, of the, the pe two sides of a river. On one side of the river, the people are very happy, and on the other side of the river, the people are miserable and they're bent over because they're always carrying big bags of rocks on their back. So sometimes the people on the side of the river carrying the big bags of rocks, they look over and they see everyone very happy on the other side. And the people on the side said, why don't, why don't you come cross the river, come and join us? He said, no, I, I, can't, if, I can't cross the river because I'd have to give up my rocks. The rocks would push me down into the river and I'd drown. And so just give up the rocks then you can easily cross over. No, no, give up my rocks. Give up my rocks. What are you talking about? The more rocks you carry, the more prestigious you are, you see. 
See, my son, when he grows up, he's going to be a success. He's going to be able to carry 27 rocks on his back. And see, oh, look, your son can only carry three. He's a failure. Oh, he's a failure. He can only carry three rocks. So they, they make the whole society based on the idea that the more rocks you carry, the, more, the better you are. But the people on the other side of the river, they're dancing and singing and they, they don't carry, and they look over there and say, these people, they're not carrying any rocks. They're deviants, they're fools, but they look very happy. They must be taking some drugs. <laughs> so the idea, you can understand, the, the, the understanding is very easy, that people are carrying their material attachments and their, not their, only their material attachments, but the material accoutrements, or the, the objects that they think will give them happiness. And all you have to do is give them up, then you can easily cross the ocean of birth and death and go to the land where people are happy. But they won't give it up because they think it's a horrible idea to give up carrying these rocks, to carry up these, these material attachments, and to surrender to Krishna. <clears throat> You may be so accustomed to carry the rocks, you, do, you don't even know how to put them down. So you have to ask Krishna, that please help me. That, uh, that, uh, this, uh, that the rocks, it's too difficult to give them up. But okay, I'll surrender to Krishna, then Krishna will take them away. And taking away the rocks can be painful when, you've, when we've been accustomed to carrying them for a long time. It may be painful, even physically, to give them up. So Krishna may arrange for us to give up our attachments, but it may be very painful, just like someone takes a loan and they have a good job and they take a loan for their house, and then all of a sudden they're told they don't have a job. And oh, Krishna, it's, it's, he becomes very distressed, but devotee can say, oh, Krishna is removing my material attachments. If he can see like that, then he's making spiritual progress. So whatever sense that someone might have is spoiled by modern education. And even, or any materialistic education, even you see t-shirts, there are t-shirts with all different mottos on them. And one of them you see from time to time is, I was born intelligent, but then they sent me to school. So even the, even the materialists can understand, some of them, that education is actually meant for dumbing us down, for making us more stupid. And we often find that young children, when, when, if we go and preach, we'll, we'll find that young children often ask very good questions. But then when they get older, they don't ask very good questions. When they're young, they ask well, questions like, well, why are we suffering? How can we understand God? When they get older, they get more dull. They may have some brightness, some of them, some brightness which comes from throwing themselves enthusiastically into the rat race. So they have some brightness of intelligence which comes from, <coughs> from trying to be fit enough to run on the treadmill faster than others. But spiritually they're, they're dull. <coughs> so this whole idea of modern education, you, you become a wealth seeker, a pleasure seeker. This is Instead of understanding our sanatana dharma is to understand Krishna, they make it seem that our, our eternal function is to earn money and to enjoy ourselves, enjoy the senses. But they don't even uh, give an understanding that anyway we're all going to die in a few days. Why don't they think about that? It's, it's insanity that we don't think that I'm going to die soon, what happens after that? It's completely edited out 
of the educational curriculum. Don't even ask that question. It's considered very wrong even to think or ask such questions. If a child asks such questions, something wrong. Hey, don't ask that. The very question you should ask is considered wrong to ask such questions. <clears throat> So, and then, and then because it's uh, material life, everyone is envious of everyone else. So there's more and more violence in society and science has developed how to develop more and more rockets and bombs and all kinds of things to kill other people. The, the more we develop our civilization and then we become afraid that someone else is going to come and and overrun us and take everything away, so then we, de we develop very sophisticated systems of, of military systems to defend ourselves and to attack others also. For instance, this uh, modern civilization runs on oil, and the oil is not, uh, it's not where the s successful countries want it to be. It's, it's in in uh, countries like the, uh, the Gulf countries, so they have to make sure that the Gulf countries' rulers do what they want, and if they don't, then there is the US Navy, Army, and Air Force to ensure that the oil flow keeps on flowing from the Gulf countries to America. And if you don't comply, then they might either attack you or, in the case of Iran, sanction them to try to, to try to starve them and force them into submission. So it's very demoniac, actually. The whole society is very, very demoniac. And a, a major problem I see of our devotees today is that they don't realize how bad this civilization is. They seem to think that, well, you can just be a normal person within this society and chant Hare Krishna. But the, to be a normal person in this society means to be a demon because it's a demoniac civilization. You might be very nice and polite and look after your children nicely and join the Rotary Club and erect bus shelters for the people going to work in your factory <coughs> so that they arrive not completely devastated even before they start their job because you want them to be in good shape so that they can, they can give every, every cell of their being working for your... So you, you, make a, you make a bus shelter. The Rotary Club puts a bus shelter for the people waiting for their bus to go to work. But uh, devotees don't realize how bad this civilization or how, es how essential is the culture that Prabhupada wanted us to adopt. Now, of course, it is possible to be Krishna conscious within, while living within this demoniac civilization. It's possible to be Krishna conscious in hell, anywhere. But the actual fact is that we see that devotees, they don't get time to, they have no time for quality japa. They have no time for reading. Uh, and Maybe it's just to make them feel good while they're being ground up in this evil civilization. What's this down the road? Reliance? Is that beneficial? It's evil what they do to people. They take people in and they chew them up. They, they drain every drop of blood out of them. And whatever they pay them, they take it right back because all the shops are owned by the same company. So whatever they have to buy, they have to buy, and they, they, it, it's just exploitation to the max. And that's called having a good job. And devotees think, oh, very good, I've got a good job. So th this culture that Prabhupada gave us, he wanted us to start these farms and revive Vedic culture and have gurukuls. Devotees don't realize how much needed it is for our own sakes and, and to give an example to the rest of society. 
they are, many of them they think that it's that it's actually wrong to do this. Why, sh if you have a good job in the city, why should you go and live on the farm? Why subject your, why force your children to get up early in the morning? Why don't you send them to a good school? So our devotees, because they don't read Prabhupada's books, and to convince them to chant Hare Krishna, you just tell them to give a, give a very light program so they don't realize the seriousness of it all. So we find that most, most devotees in ISKCON today are enthusiastic about being material successes, maybe even more than the average karmi. They're so, they're so enamored by the idea of being a material success, which is not a success at all. The, the word material and success, they shouldn't be put together because there's no real such... We say material success, but what it means is that what materialistic people consider to be success, but actually there's no such thing as material success. Because everything in material life is a failure. But it's just that people, it's what they, it's what is conventionally known as success. But it's not success at all, because success means success means to go to Krishna's world and never come back. That's success. It's not success to be a doctor or a lawyer or a chartered accountant and then get born again. And again, and again. That's not success. That means you've, the human life has been misused. <clears throat> so we find that uh, devotees, some members of ISKCON, they're they're very passionate and enthusiastic about promoting all kinds of things which make ISKCON look like a very good part of the world today. Join the United Nations effort to plant trees and that will make us recognize by the United Nations will give us a pat on the head. Very good. Very good. You planted some trees. What about do, doing what Prabhupada said, making farm projects, and automatically we have we've trees and everything. But living in the city and then plant a tree here and there. Very good. The United Nations, the, the Prabhus, I want to tell you, the goal of life is to please the United Nations. Right? Obvious, isn't it? Yasya prasada, bhagavat prasada, yasya prasada nagatika topi. Plant a tree, take a photo, stick it on the internet, and everyone will say, oh, very good people, Hare Krishna people, very good people. They plant trees while they dedicate their life to becoming a material success. They fooled you. <laughs> they fooled you, folks. <laughs> so we have a different... Uh, we have a different outlook altogether. Different outlook. The outlook is anadi karma phale paribhavarna vajale that we are in this material ocean since time immemorial. Now by the grace of Srila Prabhupada we have the opportunity to come out. You may say, well you can be a materialist, you can be a material, you can aspire to be a material success and at the same time chant Hare Krishna and go back to Godhead. But there is a warning it's not just that by chanting you're, going, you're necessarily going to go back to Godhead. Because if we cultivate material desires side by side, then we can go on many lifetimes like that. That's the warning. Now, it, it's not impossible to go back to Godhead while living in the city life. It's not, a, it is possible, but it depends on the kind of desires that we cultivate. So the, the farm communities are meant for demonstrating how to live the way that Krishna made the world in line with how Krishna wanted society to be organized uh, 
in the in the materialistic life we can chant Hare Krishna, but it's swimming upstream. You know that if you're in the river and you try to swim upstream. Has there anyone ever tried to swim upstream in the Ganga? Ganga is very strong current. Very difficult. You have to be very strong. But if you just turn around, you don't even have to swim at all. You can just float downstream. So it is possible to make progress in, by living in the middle of this materialistic society, but one has to be very strong. The problem is that the whole nature of the society tends to make you weak by taking up all your time just for maintaining your existence and by bombarding you with materialistic desires and putting you in the association of materialistic people. Whereas living in Krishna's setup, the whole setup is favorable for cultivating Krishna consciousness. So this mass education, it makes it just a, a whole situation in which people are brainwashed into thinking that, that we, this, this is the way to live life. And with the advent of the internet, everyone thinks, everyone overnight becomes a great philosopher and so many, never in the history of the world have so many fools had such a platform to express their foolishness. The, you, can, you can make yourself from, from zero to hero, put yourself on the internet, blabber some nonsense, and there you go. And you see how many likes you get. If you don't get enough likes, you might commit suicide. It happens, right? No one liked me. Oh, no one liked me. What's, what's it called, YouTube? What's the other one? Facebook. I didn't get enough Facebook likes. Oh, I have to commit suicide. It's all madness. So many, everyone thinks they have something important to say. We should just say what Krishna says, that's all. Just say, if we speak what Krishna says, then it's important. And if we want to make ourselves into some kind of self-made sadhu with all these wise things to say, very wise, but no Krishna. Yeah, very wise. All kinds of things to say. Love means eternal forgiveness. Yeah, and so many things like that. But where's Krishna? Without Krishna, everything is meaningless however wise it might sound, however many likes you get, we only need one like from Guru and Krishna. That's all. And then we don't care if we have millions of dislikes. What's it called? Thumbs down? The whole world may give us a dislike, but we just want Krishna to give us the one like. That's all. And we can do that simply by repeating what he says. That's all. We may be fools, rascals, fallen, sinful, whatever. But if we simply repeat what Krishna says, that is our success. And everything else is a failure. This is our conviction. And therefore, with conviction in the transcendental intelligence of His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, we are developing these gurukuls and farm communities in the face of uh, the as a protest against the whole materialistic civilization and even against all the materialistic tendencies of our glorious comrades in arms or fellow devotees today. We, we, we're not into this. We, we're not at all interested in your becoming a success and making schools in which we're, we're going to turn out IIT with, with this school, this, they call it a gurukul. We're going to be getting so many, sending so many boys and girls to IIT. 
we don't, we're not at all interested. As far as we're concerned, it's a failure. If you took a child for so many years, and then at the end he wants to go to IIT, it's a failure. Because he should want to go back to Godhead, not to IIT, to become another, yet another, yet another deluded student. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Srimad Bhagavatam Kijai. Any question, comment? Anything? Yeah. They, they want to send their children to IIT, devotees. Same time they're chanting Hare Krishna wearing Kanti Mala. So why don't you send them to, uh, to preach all over the world? If you're actually so convinced about Krishna consciousness that you think it's good that your children wear Kanti Mala and Tilak, then why don't you send them to preach? If you think it's a good idea to be a devotee, why are you sending them to a materialistic college? Why don't you send them to preach and benefit others? Huh? Yeah. You have to speak in the mic. You were shouting, but I couldn't hear. There's a there's a there's a sparrow here who's who's uh, giving a Srimad Bhagavatam class. Speak in the mic. Oh, it goes there. I see. What did he say? Could you hear it? They're going to IIT, they can preach better. They, yeah, they can preach that you should have a good job. That's their preaching by their practical example. They can preach in the colleges, the same thing. That, that go to IIT, have a job, dedicate 90% of your Dedicate, what is it? In our devotees, most of them today, their first, the main activity of their life is working before they save inu kripona durajana, working for some rascal. Their number two focus is their family, and somewhere squeezing all of that is their devotional service. So, so to make them feel good, they tell them that their studies are their devotional service. You might as well say that, well, why go to IIT? You can, be a, you can preach Krishna consciousness and then you can be an engineer. If you, if you sit in the temple and chant Hare Krishna and go and take books, and then you can be an engineer. The purpose of, the purpose of coming to the temple is not to be, the purpose of going out to IIT is to be an engineer. The purpose of going to the Gurukul is to be a preacher. Function and utility, something like that. You can, you can use a pen for scratching your head, but the real use is to, for writing. So you can, you can preach Krishna consciousness, but what is going to your, what's your conception being? You, to preach, first of all, you have to learn, but your head is full of, I don't know, is, uh, this equations and this and that. Who are you going to preach to? The other, the other kids are busy studying also. So you have very little time. It makes no sense, actually. It makes no sense. You can preach to other people to be materially ambitious devotees and squeeze in in about maximum 5% of their time some chanting of Hare Krishna. But that's not Srila Prabhupada's vision or Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's vision of changing the world with Krishna consciousness. Muridha, what, what degree do you have? Diploma. In? Diploma in electronics. So you could have been an electric mystery, is it? Something with like that? Does anyone ever ask you what degree you have, this, that? Does anyone ever ask you, Keshavananda? 
Probably they do huh? when you go to preach. No one asked me, actually. I have been asked from time to time. It used to be more in India they'd ask you, what is your educational qualification? Nowadays they don't, I don't know. Maybe they warn people in advance not to tell, not to ask me. Something like that. I'm aware, I remember once in New Zealand I met some, some woman and she asked me, I spoke to her for a few minutes, she said, which university did you go to? She just presumed I'd been to university. After speaking to me for a few minutes. This one line from Prabhupada's books is worth more than all the IITs put together. Isn't it? Really, it's a fact. It's real education. Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Pada, Sevanam, Arjanam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atne, Vedam, Itipung, Sapita, Vishnu, Bhaktis, Chain, Nevalakshana, Creator, Bhagavat, Yata, Tanmanye, Dita, Mutamam. According to Prahlad Maharaj, the best education is that which is worshipping Vishnu. So we have a different value system. We have a different value system means that basically at the root there's a basic difference in understanding, isn't it? The, the, the value system that people have or the philosophy, it's based on their understanding of the nature of reality. So it's not, it's not that we just have a different approach to Krishna consciousness, but it's a completely different understanding of what Krishna consciousness is. The idea that you can be, f that you can be fully Krishna conscious while you're absorbing your mind most of the time in pursuing a, a career is uh, it's not correct according to the teachings of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. It might be that some people are able to, to do, but if, if, if it was the, the normal result of going to IIT and chanting Hare Krishna, they become a pure devotee, then why didn't Prabhupada do that? Why did he want, to, why did he want his devotees, his disciples' children not to go to such institutions and to go to Gurukul instead? Why did he refer to the, these educational institutions as slaughterhouses? Is there any reason for that? Ah. Uh. They're given a very, very high post in the government and encourage other people to be a materialist and chant Hare Krishna also. Yeah, the, the idea that they'll go get government posts, but the idea, the, the idea is to perpetuate the present society, which by its very nature is demoniac. Is it not? Our success will be when the High Court judge has tilak. Actually, it used to be in South India that all the High Court, the Indian High Court judges, they'd, they were all Brahmins and they'd either have Shaiva tilak or Ramanuja tilak, or maybe some of them with Madhva tilak. Yeah, so we should convert the High Court judges to, uh, to be Vaishnavas. But I see that our devotees, they don't wear tilak. Isn't it? The ones who are, becoming, who are interested in becoming material successes, they deliberately don't wear tilak 
So where's, the, where's that going to happen if you say that you'll become a high court judge, but they, they, won't, they won't wear tilak? They think it's anti-preaching to wear tilak, is it not? Anyway, let's finish now because we're supposed to have the meeting starting in one hour. And these, you already know the answer to it before you ask the question. That anyway, it's all bogus, all these ideas. I'll just answer, okay, whatever kind of question you want to bring it up, there's a box with bogus written on it. Just write down your question and throw it in there, that's all. In the bogus box. Hare Krishna. Vancha kalpata rupyas chakipa sindhya vya vichapatita anam pavanebhyo vaishnavebhyo namo namaha.